Hello everyone, this is Steve Swanson from the Muppet Cast. In 2010, I took the Muppet Cast on a great big road trip, and one of my stops was at the home of Jean Beretta, the author and illustrator behind some awesome children's books, and who's become a good friend of mine. As some Muppet fans might know, he's the big brother of Bill Beretta, and he was a storyboard artist for Muppets from Space. You may not know that both he and his brother used to work at Sesame Place, the amusement park in Pennsylvania that's entirely dedicated to Sesame Street. Well, in summer of 2015, I was invited to be shown around Sesame Place by my buddy Guy Hutchinson, the co-writer of the only official Sesame Place book and one heck of a podcaster. I took him up on that offer, and this meant I was heading to Pennsylvania for another fun trip. Unfortunately, another Muppet podcaster, J.D. Hansel, had threatened to crash my party with Gene and Guy, mostly because he had some silly little gripe about my podcast's opening theme that doesn't really matter now and didn't matter then. But I didn't let that worry me, and I had a great time hanging out with Gene again until you-know-who showed up. Collection. You can see. Come on in. These are all Billy's characters in some kind of toy form. Dinosaurs, Johnny Fiamma, Swedish Chef, Rolf, Manamana, Dr. Teeth, Pepe. Here's an egg from the set of dinosaurs. Here's a little embroidered patch from one of the dinosaur biker characters, I think. Lunchbox dinosaurs. Stickers, things like that. I wasn't aware of the existence of those particular stickers, interestingly. I think they're pretty new. They must be. Yeah. And some pins and all that. I don't have yeah. the strength in my hand to do that. Oh, yeah, man. That's it. Now I'll just strum it. Okay. You did an E minor chord. There you go. We go. What are you doing? <laughs> Are you videotaping? Oh, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. This is a mildly embarrassing. Come on, now. I'm teaching him an E minor chord so he can play Jerry Nelson's guitar. Okay, there you go. And? And the, if I can get it halfway loud enough. There you go. Yay! There you go. First time for everything. We soon headed on our way from Wynwood to Langhorn to meet up with Guy, and that's when things really got cooking. Well, we were in the newspaper once when we... Shut up! This is Charles Bame, which was 9th and 10th grade, where Billy and I both went to 9th and 10th grade. We used to have an organization called the BTOA, the Bologna Throwers of America. And we would buy loaves of sliced bologna, and we would drive through the neighborhood, fold them up in a nice aerodynamic form, and toss them out and do drive-bys at people. And they would open up and smack them in the chest and things like that. And one day we were on one of our <laughs> on one of our runs, and we came by because we saw that all the students... We had left this school at that point. So we, we came by and we saw some old friends. They were all waiting for the bus. There were a couple hundred kids out here. We pulled up. And Billy was driving and we were in my, our grandparents' nice big Oldsmobile. He was showing off a little bit. And we had a big empty box of potato chips in the back. And Billy's talking to his friend. He's standing here and the friend's right here. And um, the guy in the back seat throws the empty box out of the car window. And Billy got a little embarrassed. He goes, what are you doing? So Billy opened the door and the, the car was in, par, in, in reverse somehow. And he had his foot on the brake, so now if you'll go back around. So stay there. Okay. Billy opened the door to reach back for the box, and as he reached back, his foot came off of the brake, and the car rolled back, hitting him in the butt, and flipped him over so that his back was on the street and his legs were sandwiched in, and his face was pressed into the gravel and I jumped over the back seat and put my hands on the brakes and saved his head from being squashed by the tire. <laughs> 
So he almost, he basically ran himself over. And then uh, he got up and was a little bit embarrassed. And uh, so I said, are you okay? And he was a little bit too proud. And he said, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Meanwhile, there's all these little bits of gravel embedded in his cheek. So he sat back in and, and he drove away very proudly. So that's the story of how Billy ran himself over with a car. Speaking of accidents, you see this driveway here? Well, I was, uh, we were on our bicycles one day and I was cutting across the grass, the corner grass there to go to the driveway. It was a friend's house. And I don't know what I hit, but I hit something, maybe that grating if it was there, and I flew over the front handlebars and my, hit, my chin hit the, the driveway and I was, oh, and I was injured. And Billy panicked and ran, and, and he was on his bike and he panicked and he drove over there as quickly as he could to help me. But instead he actually ran over my head with his tire. So not only did I first hit my chin and gravel, but I was kind of dazed and all of a sudden I just felt <laughs> <coughs> 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 As some of you may know, Billy and I met um, Brian Henson working at Sesame Place. And during that time, we were living here at, on Rensong Road. Is this, where is 624? There we are. See the blue door there? That's where we lived, that was our apartment. And the, first, the garage on the right is uh, where I was working on a stop motion animation. <clears throat> And uh, Brian would come and uh, help me build little stop-motion uh, figures for the animation. And what was really special about the occasion was that I, uh, I had been talking to him about how I didn't have a 16 millimeter camera to film the animation. And one weekend he went home to New York and he came back with his dad, Jim's 16 millimeter camera for me to use. And so it was in that garage that Brian and I whittled away at clay figures. Um, and uh, I never finished the film, but it was at least fun building the stuff and making all of the clunky rushes. Here's a little very, very minuscule <laughs> minor Muppet moment for you. When my mom remarried, we lived in this house. And uh, my stepdad's name was Johnny Russo. That front porch was where uh, the kitchen used to be. Anyway, Johnny used to sell used cars, and one day he said to Billy, uh, Billy, I'm just, uh, we're going out for the night. And Billy didn't even have a license yet, and Johnny said, whatever you do, I don't want you playing with the car, okay? Just leave it alone. I guess it was based on some previous experiences. So he said, uh, so Billy said, of course, no, I'm not going to take the car, right? So they, my parents went out for the night. Billy immediately got on the phone and called the neighbor who lived across the street here and another friend and said, they're out, let's go to McDonald's. So they got in the car, which was parked right about where we are, and they got in, and the brakes didn't work, and they rolled back down the hill. And uh, the friend, fortunately, was a mechanic, so they fixed the brakes, and they went off to McDonald's without anybody knowing. They came home. The next morning, Johnny came into Billy's bedroom and said, Billy, wake up. Yeah, did uh, you use the car last night? No, why would I use the car? Are you sure you didn't use the car? Johnny, no, you told me not to. Oh, it's interesting because when I brought the car home last night, the brakes were broken and now they're fixed. And there's french fries in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's my brother. This is the house Billy and I grew up in. And the top left window was my room. Top right was his. Uh, and this is where Billy... <laughs> accident number three. <laughs> This is where Billy almost lost his life because we used to uh, make Super 8 films and I would, we would climb out, see the top windows, which don't look quite the same as they did when we were here. Um, we used to climb out of that and make our way around the roof and climb up onto the roof to do some aerial shots. And Billy once lost his footing and slid down and if it weren't for the gutter he would have flown off this roof and killed himself or something. So that was possible accident number three. I'm only going to tell you stories where we almost lose our lives. Yeah, that's, that's good. And then the, these woods, that was basically our playground, those woods back there. We built lots of tree forts and underground forts and, and did lots of things that kids wouldn't be allowed to do these days. Accident number four. We used to have a small Pomeranian named Sheba. And if it got out of the house by accident, the only way we could get it back was to get into one of our cars to act like we were going on a trip. 
So one day, I was lying down on the floor in the living room, which are those bottom two windows on the left, just a lazy Sunday afternoon, and my mom's on the phone. I'm just listening to her talk to one of her friends. And all of a sudden, I hear her say, Oh my God, my car's going down the hill. And what had happened was, Billy got into the car, which was parked right about there, to call the dog, and somehow he released the brake or whatever, or the, put it into gear somehow, and the car rolled down the hill and ran into that telephone pole. <laughs> and it basically, the pole basically saved him from, dr from running into the neighbor's yard into their home. One of our favorite things to do when we were young and playful was to spy on neighbors. And we would just, uh, we got a thrill out of just being able to uh, maneuver our way around the yard so they couldn't see us. We thought we were pretty cool. And this ravine right here uh, is one of our favorite play spots. It's actually a spot, speaking of here, accident number five, Billy cracked his head open 11 times down in this ravine. One night we were actually in the dark, in the woods spying, and my mom and grandmother showed up because we got them so interested. I put this in. It was, it was a really bad story. After the first tour, we had a nice lunch that somehow resulted in crayon drawings all over the table. And then we continued our second tour of the day, the Sesame Place tour. All right, so here we are at something that we actually didn't plan on stopping at, but we saw it from the side of the road, and Guy actually knows more about this than JD and I. I was going to make JD talk about this and kind of put him on the spot. So go ahead, JD. All right. Well, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, uh, Guy, what, tell us tell us a little bit about the uh, the water tower here. The water tower here. This is the Middleton Township water tower. There's a highway that runs along here, and they don't have billboards. There's no billboards allowed right. on it. Yeah. So in the 1990s, Sesame Place approached them and said, "Hey, can we put a billboard on this on this water tower?" And they agreed to do it for a fee that you know is was in the newspapers. They were shocked at how low it was, uh, and they painted it. They painted beautiful pictures of Elmo. They're not there now, but they painted beautiful pictures of Elmo, a uh, big bird, a twiddle bug, Ernie and Bert, I believe. And they wrapped around. It was white background with the characters painted at the bottom and then the logo. And then um, maybe in the early 2000s, the paint, you know, the expiration had come up on that. And so they did a wrap uh, like the one behind me. But this, I think, is the third wrap that they put up. They'll, uh, they'll change the wrap out every now and then with new images. But yeah, this is a, a gigantic billboard. It's probably the biggest billboard any theme park has anywhere. It's, it's pretty darn big. All right, that's, that's impressive. Uh, JD, what, what you like it? I yeah, it's pretty nice. So, um. <laughs> come on, come on, everybody, come on, come on, get on your feet. Come let the fun the party start. Meet me on Sesame Street. Wow, I gotta say, I'm seeing a lot of stuff that I remember and a lot of stuff that I don't recognize at all that I'm really excited to get to see. I am. Thoroughly impressed, and my one uh, request is that they change the finders keepers to hoopers keepers, because I would find that much more fun and charming. But boy, is it busy with activity. This is something absolutely amazing and much bigger and grander and more exciting than I was expecting. So in 1980, and for many years after, this was a street, parking lot was all on this side, and the entrance was right here. And then where this carousel is, there was the giant big bird head and you'd walk up through his mouth that would be right there there would be uh, ticket booths right here the sign that was at the turnstile would have been right here it would have been right here you'd come up here and there was a flight of stairs giant big bird head at the top and you'd walk across there there was a suspension bridge and you could see the whole park from there because this was the whole park none of that none of that none of that was here Everything was right here. Can we check out the studio? For yeah, let's go take a look. We're in Sesame Studio, is that what it's called yes. still? It's still called Sesame Studio. All right. If you turn around, you'll see that it looks nothing like it looked when I was here. And this theater here, inside there, is where they used to have a big replica of Sesame Street neighborhood. And one day, Billy and I were in here working, and they had characters in the windows of the 123 Sesame Street house and they were just set up to wave and behind 123 was the area where we kept a lot of the buckets and brooms and things so we could get back there and one day it was a full house and Billy went back 
and went behind, all the way behind 123 Sesame Street. And for about a minute, he stood in the window in his employee outfit like this. And I was cracking up. And just as he did it, one of our bosses brought a tour of her bosses through. <laughs> and they just, they just didn't know what to make of it. They were just staring at Billy, waiting for him to do something. And he was just like this in the window. <laughs> in the window. He must be cookie at the disco. He must be cookie in the foggy music. He must be cookie at the disco. He walked his back. He walked his back again. So this whole area, there were all these nets here, and then everything was under it, and a lot of it was sunk down. The idea was so kids could play and they could look up and see their parents wherever they were. Uh, Big Bird's Nest was over here, which was a large, round, foam, yellow padded foam area that kid, little kids could, could bounce around on. Uh, yeah, I bet, right? And then over here was Cookie Mountain, which was kind of like a tarp you'd climb up. There was uh, Ernie's Bed Bounce straight back there, which was basically a moon bounce. I almost got in a fight with a guy on moon bounce because he, he just pushed his kids ahead of a line of about 30 people. But I couldn't do anything about it, but he just insisted on, like, F this, I'm just going to, uh, yeah. I'm not waiting. Yeah. What's, what's interesting about, like, that is that's a very common thing, a moon bounce. Yeah. But back then, it was so popular when they opened, they built a second one the next year, and that lasted one more season, because it was just, the line was so long for it. Yeah. Um, they also, the ball crawl, this is one of the first places to have a ball crawl. Yeah, uh, the ball crawl was invented do by one of the designers. Of working in the ball thing, yeah, lifting really kids out. Yeah. Wow. This used to be a theater. They had a bird show in here and the Sesame Players. Uh, now it's a photo op. Uh, this here is the only thing that's been here since opening day. This tube slide right back here. That's the only thing. There's a couple other things that have been here since a couple years after they opened, like the water slide. This is. That wall there is where the Oscar, the Oscar animatronic used to be, and there was a day when Jim Henson made a, I don't know if it was a surprise visit, but none of the employees knew about it. And that was the first day Billy and I met him. Billy went over to him and said hi, and Jim said, uh, do you know where this Oscar animatronic thing is? I want to take a look at it. So Billy proudly brought him over to it and hung out and watched Jim observe the Oscar animatronic right in that spot. Wow. That was his first connection. There was also also a uh, cookie monster, which was inside the restaurant uh, as well, and he was inside of a cookie jar. This uh, they put this in here for the 35th. They had this very famous in Sesame Studio photo op with Ernie in the bathtub, and so they wanted to kind of recreate it. Yeah, I know. Here it goes.
great parade. Uh, probably one of the better in park parades that I've seen. Now I might be a little bit biased considering that it's Sesame Street characters and that's, you know, our turf. But uh, what do you think? I did enjoy it. Yeah, I just couldn't see all that much of it because unfortunately I'm not quite as tall as you are. But I was going to say, I had a great viewpoint. I don't know about you. Yeah, but, uh, no, I did not. So I did get to see a few characters. I loved seeing Barkley back there. Did you notice yes, him I there? Yes, I saw Barkley the dog sitting saw, in the dog house. Let's I get the shade over here, by I the way. I think I saw Stinky the Stinkweed. Yeah, um, uh, Slimy the Worm, of course, and yeah, Oscar's slimy. trash can. Oh, yeah. It was um, quite a great cast they got together. And yes. I was, I was pretty pleased. Yeah, I was too. This is uh, the Count's Splash Castle. Uh, this used to be the Count's Fount, and uh, I think Little Bird's Bird Bath was over here as well. Uh, but they added this about five years ago, I think, and it's pretty impressive. It's got a really great feature where the bucket dumps, which we'll get to see in a bit. Over here, this big sign that says Monster Rock Theater was originally a clock with Grover's face, that actual physical thing there, the sign was a clock with Grover's face and an Oscar pendulum at the bottom. And uh, Grover's eyes would move from side to side as the pendulum swung. I guess it broke at some point. They got rid of the pendulum first and made it a big bird clock, and then they just made it a, a sign. So, all right, here we go. So when this opened, this was the largest attraction they had. Uh, it still, I think, is the biggest in scope. And but at the time, it was it was revolutionary. Since then, they've added some pretty impressive rides over here, but nothing is like this. Over here, this is Oscar's garage. Now, it used to, it's a store now, but it used to be an exhibit. And the Count Mobile from Follow That Bird was right over here for years. They just didn't know what to do with it, so they sent it here, and they kept it. It, uh, in a couple places, but it was over here next to the garage for a long time. They used to call this Sesame Island, but they don't really use the term as much because they've kind of expanded to where you can't really visualize it. But you can see we're crossing over this lazy river, so everything we're going to be, all these attractions here, are in the middle, in an island in the middle of the river. This was the biggest expansion when they did this. They took, this was all parking lot, and they bulldozed it, and they built just the river first, then they started building all the other things in here. Ernie's Waterworks. It's the thinnest boat on the planet, if you can take a look there. Oh, yeah. So, and then this is Twiddlebug Land, which is uh, like a much more elaborate version of the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids Play area at uh, Disney Hollywood Studios. I did some research on this fire truck for the book. I didn't end up using it, but this uh, was from Joy, uh, the Newtown Junkyard. So this was most likely, you know, a real fire truck. That, the rest yeah, the rest is, no, it's not cut off, it is back there. You used to be able to walk around it. I, at some point, they roped it off. This used to be much more interactive. There, was, there, there were like food props in there the kids could play with. We uh, soon Steve, 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 please. I think I ought to take over the narration for this part because you've done enough great work already and you deserve a break. And you talk way too slow, which is really boring. After hey. our walk down... Uh, shut up. After our walk down Sesame Street, we went into the big gift shop, Hooper's Emporium. I ran around shooting video of all the merchandise at a speed that's humanly impossible because the footage was sped up in post. It was great to see so many Muppety things all in one room, and it was also a nice way to wrap up our time in the park. 
I gotta say, while I may have intended to spend my time with Steve playing out my petty revenge plot against him, as was alluded to in the opening scene to which this is a very forced bookend, I'm glad we could all just have fun. We learned some neat Muppet history, we took some fun photos, we said and heard things I can never repeat if I want to live, Bill Beretta almost died 15 times, and most of all, we had some good laughs. It was a lovely, sunny day for everyone. There, wouldn't you say that closing was alright? Alright. Good, good, I'm glad you <laughs>